My name is Jacob Schreiber, and I'm here to talk with you about Pomegranate, which has been a, it's been a side project slash obsession of mine for the last few years. Uh, so I'm really excited to be able to talk with you about it because it's the first time I've talked about it in a public audience ever. Um, <laughs> thank you. I mean, I think that applause may be premature. Maybe you should like wait to see if I actually know what I'm talking about. Uh, so Pomegranate is a fast and flexible probabilistic modeling language for uh, uh, probabilistic modeling for um, for Python, and there is an accompanying IPython notebook which I forgot to uh, tell the I forgot to tell the organizers about in time. But basically, if you go to the main if you go to the main Pomegranate GitHub repository, which is githubcom jmsly slash Pomegranate, like up here, then you'll see a folder called Tutorials. And in this folder called Tutorials, the top one is going to be the IPython notebook tutorial that goes along with this talk. In addition, there are other tutorials that correspond to the individual models which we'll be talking about in case you want some additional examples, code, or anything else. Uh, so Pomegranate, to get, you know, to do the administrative uh, at the beginning, it works on all platforms. It works on Python 2, it works on Python 3, and it has a pretty simple set of requirements, which is just joblib, networkx, numpy, scython, matplotlib, and if you want pretty graphical models, then pygraphviz. All of these, except for pygraphviz, seem to be pip installable the last time I checked. Um, so it should be fairly easy to get. Pomegranate really started when I was an undergraduate at the University of California, Santa Cruz. And yes, that really is the logo. The mascot is the banana slug, a really ferocious logo. Uh, I was working, I was doing research in the nanopore group, and I, I was doing research in the nanopore group, which is basically trying to develop a new DNA sequencing technology. The premise behind how this technology worked was that if you move strands of DNA through a really small hole called a nanopore, then the different nucleotides should impede ionic current in different ways, and you should be able to uh, decode these ionic current fluctuations in order to get back the original sequence. This should allow you to be much faster and accurate than more, uh, much faster and accurate than other technologies which currently exist. In addition, a currently available device called the MinIon uh, basically requires you to just put in small samples of DNA and you, into a thumb drive-like thing that you literally plug into your computer. Uh, in contrast, all other technologies are the, basically these big box servers that are around the size of a big moving box. Uh, so it's pretty crazy. An example of the type of signal that you would get from the nanopore looks basically like this. You can see that there are, seem to be these distinct ionic current segments. And each one of these segments does correspond to a different nucleotide going through the pore. It seems pretty easy that if you use some sort of model, you'd be able to take in the, these ionic current segments and decode it back into the original sequence. Unfortunately, the group at the time was made up predominantly of biochemists and biophysicists, because in order to get this technology working at all, you need a massive amount of domain knowledge. When I started, I was pretty much the first person who had any type of computer science or statistics background. Uh, and so over the course of the next two and a half years, um, in addition to publishing papers on uh, nanopore-like things, I was able to automate this entire process. A major problem they were facing at the time is that uh, a major problem that they were facing at the time is that it could oftentimes take, it could take several times longer to analyze the data than to simply collect it. And so they are left with situations where it would take them a few days to collect the data and then a few months in order to analyze it. In addition, if you're doing this by hand, you're going to introduce human biases into the results. And I do remember a lot of times when we'd be sitting around a table trying to figure out what exactly the result was and everyone arguing with everyone else because they all had their own they all had their own metrics for when a segment ended or what an event really was, and everyone would just argue with each other. It seemed like a mathematic solution was the most appropriate thing. So uh, my advisor and I first tackled this problem by finding a way to segment these into the discrete chunks. Basically, different segments are indicated by different, uh, by different color pattern. Uh, adjacent segments that have different color are where the boundary happens. Then. More importantly, we're able to take in these segments uh, and feed them, into something, feed them into a hidden Markov model. And these hidden Markov models act as classifiers in order to take the sequence and decode it back into the original uh, biological sequence. In this, in this particular example, what we see is that 
uh, we have sequences which differ at a single nucleotide. And we want to use the nanopore in order to identify what the different uh, modification is at that position. The spike in teal indicates that at that position, the hidden Markov model has high confidence that we see a certain one of the modifications called hydroxymethylcytosine. The sharp uh, magenta tag later on indicates that it made a correct classification. So uh, after finishing at the University of California, Santa Cruz, I went to become a graduate student at the University of Washington, which has a you know, much more traditional mascot, the husky. Uh, though I still personally think that the banana slug could take it in a fight. Uh, I was taking computer science classes, particularly machine learning classes. And one of the things that I found was that I was basically re-implementing the same algorithm over and over again, sometimes literally. In the first year, I had to implement general mixture models three times for three different classes. What I realized was that if I could take apart, if I could take apart the components of the hidden Markov models that were implemented uh, in undergrad, then I could create a wide variety of different probabilistic models that were, that, you know, were easy to use. So what happened is that after the second time I had to implement general mixture models, I said, whatever, I'm done. I'm done just implementing this from scratch. So I took apart the package, which was originally called yet another hidden Markov model, which in retrospect was a terrible name. And I put all these components together uh, in pomegranate. And so you're allowed to, you can take the same probability distributions that you use to create hidden Markov models and now create things like mixture models or Markov change or naive Bayes or Bayesian networks. After my first year, I was offered an internship at Invia Pariatol, working with the Scikit Learn team, uh, working with the Scikit Learn team as a summer intern. The main task that they wanted me to focus on was to take their gradient boosting implementation and make it faster. During that summer, I learned a huge amount, not just about software engineering, but about getting the bare bones efficiency of Cython and about including parallel processing in your code. This biography, by the way, is not just for your personal enjoyment. You're going to see elements of this occur in, like, in how pomegranate uh, is used. So uh, ultimately, I contributed a computational trick to scikit-learn which improved the speed of decision tree regressors up to four times uh, in most cases. Since decision tree regressors are oftentimes used as, in ensembles called random forest or used in gradient boosting, it ended up speeding up every algorithm which ended up using decision tree regressors. This was actually not entirely good because my research team, uh, my competition research team at, uh, ended up, was using decision tree regressors at the time. And I remember that in a uh, nationwide meeting on the subject that I was studying, they noticed that sometime over the summer, it seemed like their algorithm was working a lot faster. And that seemed to help them move a lot faster than before. So not always great. When I returned to the University of Washington, I was supported by the eScience Institute, which supported not just me, but gave me money to develop pomegranate. Uh, during the last year was re really when I was able to focus on making pomegranate a lot faster and implement a lot of the features that I'm going to show you today. So uh, there are six main things that I'd like to talk with you about, like pomegranate seeds. They are basic probability distributions, not the naive Bayes classifier, Markov chains, general mixture models, hidden Markov models, and Bayesian networks. However, all of these things still really, if, if you want to take this metaphor a little bit further, you can say that all of these things really are still pomegranate seeds. Basically, all of these things are still probabilistic models. We're familiar with simple probabilistic uh, models, something like a normal distribution or a discrete distribution. But a general mixture model is still a distribution. It is still a probabilistic distribution, albeit a bit more complicated one. A Bayesian network is still literally a distribution that's just factored along a graphical structure. Because of this, pomegranate supports a great deal of model stacking. Uh, on the left-hand side, we have a plot of which models can be stacked within, uh, within uh, each other models. The dark blue squares correspond to model stackings which currently are supported, and the light blue squares correspond to model stackings which I'd like to support soon. Uh, we have some obvious results here. First, the basic probability distributions do make up all of the more complicated distributions, like hidden Markov models and Bayesian networks. That's to be expected. For people who are familiar with hidden Markov models, they might be familiar with the idea of a GMM HMM, which is a general mixture model hidden Markov model. And we can see that here, where general mixture models can be fit inside hidden Markov models as the emissions. But there's no reason why you couldn't do something like create a mixture of hidden Markov models. 
because a hidden Markov model is just a structured distribution over a set of sequences. And a mixture is just takes in a group of uh, distributions and uh, basically mixes them together. There's no reason why you couldn't combine those. There's no reason why you couldn't have a Bayesian network uh, naive Bayes. We're all familiar with, or at least most of us are familiar with Gaussian naive Bayes. We're trying to compare multivariate Gaussians to each other. But there's no reason why you couldn't compare a Bayesian network to another Bayesian network in a classifier. There's no reason why you couldn't compare a Bayesian network to a multivariate Gaussian and see which one better fits the data. Uh, soon I would like to support mixtures of Bayesian networks and hidden Markov models of Bayesian networks, just in case you want some more structure inside your structure. On the right-hand side, we have, models, we have this model stacking compared to other packages that I'm aware of. Uh, the orange squares correspond to other packages which implement similar features, but not to the extent that pomegranate does. In red, we have, um, we have ways of stacking models that, to my knowledge, no other Python package allows you to do. Um, so for example, I know that, say, HMMLearn is able to, uh, you, with using HMMLearn, you're able to implement Gaussian mixture model hidden Markov models. But, as you'll see in pomegranate, you can implement uh, general mixture models of arbitrary distributions. They don't have to be multivariate Gaussians. So, if you leave this talk knowing nothing else, I want you to know this. Pomegranate can do more than other packages. It can do it faster, and it's intuitive for you to learn, uh, intuitive for you to use. Uh, so perhaps you'll walk out of this uh, knowing two things. First, that, and second, that I'm a bit, you know, I'm a bit braggy. So, uh, when I was practicing this talk, there was one other point which I really wanted to fit in here, but I couldn't find a way of natively doing it, so I'm just gonna kinda do it anyway. I also want you to know there's multi-threading. Basically, there's multi-threading, not multi-processing, because in, in Python, frequently you're limited by the global interpreter lock, so you can't get true parallel, uh, you can't get multi-threading typically, you have to use multi-processing. But since the back end of pomegranate is implemented in Cython, almost all of these algorithms release the global interpreter lock, and you can use multi-threading in order to get far more efficient parallel processing than other packages. This is uh, something which I learned during my internship with scikit-learn because they use a similar thing in order to speed up many of their algorithms. So the overview of this talk is I'm gonna talk very quickly about basic probability distributions, then we're gonna go into the remaining five models which I mentioned beforehand. Lastly, what I would like to show you at the end is how you can train a mixture of hidden Markov models in parallel using multi-threading. Hopefully, by the time we get there, you'll be able to see how intuitive it is to do that and how you don't need extensive knowledge of how the back end behind any of these things work in order to get complicated models working. Let's talk quickly about the API. I mentioned that it seems like everything is basically the same, is basically a probability distribution. And so it makes sense that they share the same methods. An obvious one is that all methods implement a log probability slash probability method. We will pass in some data and you'll, get, and you'll get the appropriate probability under that distribution. Uh, you can sample, you can fit your model to some data, uh, and there are some other methods. In purple, we have the classic scikit-learn API. These aren't available for all, um, all methods because basic probability distributions it wouldn't make sense for. But any model which is composed of basic probability distributions has this scikit-learn-like API. Lastly, I want all models to have a from samples method. Uh, currently, basic probability distributions do, which I'll get into in a second. But ultimately, what I would like is for you to be able to take a Bayesian network and do from samples and have it learn the structure of the Bayesian network, or a hidden Markov model and learn the structure of the hidden Markov model. These are things which I really want to get implemented, but I have a million things that I want to do, and I'm pretty much the only core developer for this package, so everything falls to me. Uh, of these, probably the ones you'll use the most are fit and predict. These are the basic scikit-learn API of fitting a model some to some data and then using that model in order to make predictions about future data you haven't seen yet. Let's get started. So if you want to define a distribution and you already know the parameters of the distribution, it's pretty intuitive. If you have a normal distribution and you know that the mean is zero and the standard deviation is two, you just feed that in. Makes sense, intuitive. If you have a Gaussian kernel density, you can just feed in the points and that's fine, it does the best for you. If you're unfamiliar with what a uh, kernel density is, it's basically a non-parametric distribution. In this case, it takes every point and plops a little Gaussian distribution over the point. And then the full distribution is just the summation of all of these little uh, Gaussian distributions. 
If instead what you have is data, and you want to learn the parameters of the distribution before doing anything, you just pass it into using from samples, as I mentioned before. Um, I'm not sure how, is it, can you see this level of font towards the back now? Okay, I was worried about this, but basically in the purple box you have normal distribution dot from samples. If you're following along with the tutorial, all of this code is present in the tutorial, so you can either follow along now or go back to it later if you're thinking, what the hell is this guy talking about? Uh, and then you can just use the probability method and you get a normal distribution that looks like this, given data uh, that are these dot, uh, these underlying dots. Makes sense, nothing surprising here. Pomegranate supports a wide variety of distributions. Uh, we have univariate distributions, kernel densities, multivariate distributions. Uh, in purple, I have the distributions which I think that most people will use, normal distributions, multivariate Gaussians, and discrete. But in red, I have distributions that I personally like. This is not the interesting part of pomegranate, so I'm not going to talk about any other distributions. I think we should just move on from now. Pomegranate can be faster than all of its competitors. In this case, pomegranate can be faster than NumPy at extracting the parameters of distributions from data. Let's say that we have 10, um, 1,000 points on the left, that's a typo, and 10,000 points on the right. Um, Pretty much last night I was desperately trying to get this talk ready, and so there might be a few inconsistencies here, uh, but please just bear with me. Um, on the left-hand side, we have some data which is normally distributed. We can extract the mean and the standard deviation using the appropriately named mean and standard deviation method in NumPy. Alternatively, we can just fit a normal distribution to the data using the from samples method. We can see that using pomegranate is twice as fast as NumPy at extracting these parameters. If we want to extract a multivariate Gaussian, it seems like it's around twice as fast in order to extract the, me the vector of means and the full covariance matrix from the data uh, compared to NumPy. One of the reasons that this is so fast is because pomegranate doesn't go through multiple times in calculating the, uh, these statistics um, one at a time. It calculates all of them at the same time using these concept called sufficient statistics. Basically, this is a concept from statistics where you can take a data set and reduce it down to a set of numbers that you need in order to perform an exact update. For the normal distribution, if you take the sum of the weight of every point, the sum of the weighted points, and then the sum of the weighted points squared, you have enough information to perform exact updates without needing to see the data again. This has a great property because it's a summation. This means that you can look at a point a single time, add to these numbers, and then move on and never see that data point again, whereas NumPy needed to go through once and calculate the mean, and then again and calculate the standard deviation. Um, so from these points, uh, it's pretty simple to see how you can get the mean. I actually wrote the inverse here in the notebook, but it's basically the weighted points divided by the tilde sum of the weight. This makes sense to us, but there's also a way of calculating the variance using this, and that equation is, um, that equation is there as well. By calculating these sufficient statistics, you're able to be much faster than packages which do these things uh, independently. And all, uh, all of pomegranate's models support this type of sufficient statistic calculation. Because of this, pomegranate just natively supports out-of-core learning. If you're calculating these sufficient statistics, there's no reason why you have to see the entire data set at once. This is using the summarize and from summaries method. Basically, we can compare here two ways of training on data. If we generate 5,000 points, we can either fit our distribution directly to that data, or we can chunk it into five different chunks, summarize each one to the sufficient statistics, and then update the parameters of the distribution using those sufficient statistics with the dot from summaries method. Uh, the purple looking distribution here is actually both a red and a blue distribution corresponding to these two different methods that are perfectly superimposed on each other. Uh, the numbers which you probably can't read here correspond to the parameters that you learn from each one and to any noticeable level of precision, they're basically identical. So this supports two main cases. The first is when all of your data can't fit in memory. That if your data can't fit in memory, you can load up chunks, summarize it, and then when you're done reading it all, use the from summaries method. The second is if you're doing online learning. Perhaps you have an infinite stream of data and, you'd like, and you see one of them at a time or chunks of them at a time. You can summarize the data as it comes in, and then as you want, you can update the parameters of the distribution. Something which I'm currently trying to do is I'm trying to add a, sec a third method, which is clear summaries. Because right now, when you do from summaries, uh, you clear the sufficient statistics that are stored. But if you're doing online learning, what you can want to do is get a, uh, as new data points come in, calculate the sufficient statistics, and then 
um, update your parameters, but then don't forget what you saw previously, and then over time, you'll slowly get better and better um, estimates. This is a relatively simple API fix that I just haven't got it around to, but within the next few weeks will be uh, present in Pomegranate. So you, can, uh, so you can personally decide if you want to clear your summaries uh, when you update or if you want to keep them around and continue to add on to them in the future. Pomegranate can be faster than SciPy, sometimes surprisingly so. Uh, let's take the simple task of trying to calculate the probability of a single point under a normal distribution. Using SciPy, you'd, you'd use norm.logpdf, and you pass in the point and the mean and the standard deviation. Using pomegranate, you just create the distribution object and do .log probability. If we look at the time, it's around 100 times faster to use pomegranate versus SciPy in order to calculate the probability of this single point. And the difference in the resulting log probability is negligible. There's a caveat to both of these, though. Um, since both NumPy and SciPy use vectorized operations for almost everything, that if your data set grows in size, Pomegranate is going to do less well, particularly with the log probability calculation. That uh, Pomegranate currently does not have an inner vectorized uh, way of calculating these probabilities, something which I'd like to fix soon. But if you're calculating it using a loop, using even maybe 1,000 or 10,000 uh, samples, SciPy will be faster. And so if your goal is just to calculate log probabilities under this using a distribution on like a million or 10 million points, you should use SciPy. But the internals of pomegranate frequently require that you calculate the probability of a single point at a time. And so it's far better for the internals of pomegranate to have fast one-shot probability calculations versus having a vectorized form. So... Um, Right, so one of the reasons that this is faster is because pomegranate across the board uses aggressive caching in order to prevent recalculating uh, things that it knows about. When you create a normal distribution object, uh, uh, so before I get to that, so first we have the, the PDF of a normal distribution. Basically, if you have the mean and standard deviation, you plug the sample that you see into this equation, you get the probability. Now we can take the log of this, and, we can get, and this is the equation to get the log probability. But you can see this de decomposes into uh, several terms that don't actually depend on the data you're calculating the log probability of. And so when you create a normal distribution object, for example, what it does is caches the value of minus log square root of 2 pi times sigma. This means that no matter how many times you calculate log probability, you are only calculating that value once. Likewise, 2 sigma squared can also be cast because you aren't uh, changing that when you calculate new log probabilities. These values only need to be updated when you fit the distribution to new data. So what you ultimately get is basically some alpha constant, minus x minus uh, u, uh, mu squared, divided by some other constant. This means that when you're calculating the probability, you don't have to explicitly take a log or an exponent, which you traditionally do when you calculate the probability or log probability under a normal distribution. This is part of why it's so fast in pomegranate to make these calculations. So I think that at this point it's been kind of dense, and so I'd like to get to a concrete real-world real example that I think that almost all of you can relate to. So a few years ago, uh, my girlfriend wanted me to watch Gossip Girl with her, and this show is basically about a bunch of angsty um, New York teens who run around having relationships with each other, getting into trouble, and basically disappointing their parents. In the background, there's this enigmatic figure known as Gossip Girl who sends out uh, text message blasts just in time to stir up trouble. To be clear, this is trouble that if any of the two characters ever bothered talking to each other and having normal conversation like a human being, the drama would go away immediately. But I suppose for dramatic effect, they don't know how to have conversations with each other. Let's take a look at some of these blasts. Oh, before we get there, uh, Gossip Girl is supposed to be one of the main characters, and the idea is basically that um, the idea is basically that by the end of the series, they'll reveal who Gossip Girl actually is. Uh, at the end of this segment, I'm going to reveal who Gossip Girl is. So, if any of you care about that spoiler, maybe you should take like a five-minute break and leave real quick. But I figured no one here really cared. So, let's take an example of one of the first blasts that you see. Spotted, lonely boy, can't believe the love of his life has returned. If only she knew who he was. But everyone knows Serena, and everybody is talking. Wonder what Blair Waldorf thinks. Sure, they're BFFs, but we always thought Blair's boyfriend Nate had a thing for Serena. That seems like a shitty thing to say to anybody, much less send to everybody involved in, like, the cast. But what really got me hooked on Gossip Girl was not, as you can see, the intricate plot and storyline, 
but this blast, which, en which happened at the end of the first episode, why'd she leave? Why'd she return? Send me all the deets. And who am I? That's a secret I'll never tell. The only one. So basically, at, the, at that point, I, t I told my girlfriend, I'll continue watching this show with you if you help me figure out, using math, who Gossip Girl is before they reveal it. So uh, we came to that formal agreement. Um, to be clear, though, I actually enjoyed a the first few seasons of Gossip Girl. Um, but that's a secret I'll never tell. So uh, what basically happened is that we went through all of these blasts, and we encoded them in terms of whose agenda they helped and whose agenda they didn't help. For example, better lock it down with Nate B, clock's ticking. We can see that this seems like it's uh, advantageous to Nate, and it's disadvantageous to Blair. So we put a plus one for Nate and a minus one for Blair. The other characters aren't involved, so we don't care about them. Uh, this just in, S and B committing a crime of fashion. Who doesn't love a five-finger discount, especially if it's the middle one? Uh, this basically is revealing two of the main characters for you know, committing theft. So it's clearly not in either of their agendas. So this is a minus one for both of them. A fairly obvious thing that you may want to do at this point is say, OK, well, we have a bunch of plus ones, minus ones, and zeros. So let's just sum them up. And the person who has the most positive things is probably Gossip Girl. Unfortunately, this doesn't work well. It reviews some interesting things, like particularly that Blair doesn't seem like she's very well liked. It would, um, it would be very surprising if Blair was Gossip Girl, given that she has around twice as many negative things said about her as the next person. However, this doesn't, tell you, uh, this doesn't quite tell you who the person most likely to be Gossip Girl is, because Dan, Nate, and Vanessa are all tied at having the uh, least negative difference between them. So we have to move to probabilistic modeling in order to get a more nuanced view of what's going on here. Let's turn quickly to the idea of beta distributions. I know that I lured you into this complicated mathematic topic with the promise of Gossip Girl, but we're going to have to cover this. Basically, beta distributions are a distribution between 0 and 1, which are, basically, which are usually used as a way of, a, of representing a probability distribution over the probability that an event occurs. That may be a bit complicated, but the typical example is if you have a coin, and you want to figure out what is the probability that this coin is going to produce heads. The blue distribution is before you've seen anything. You've seen no heads and no tails, and so there's a uniform distribution. You have really no idea what this coin is going to do because you haven't seen any data. The teal distribution shows what happens after you see two tails. That if you used, some, if you used maximum likelihood estimates, you'd say, OK, well, the probability of seeing heads is 0 over 2, so 0%. And the probability of seeing tails is 2 over 2, so 100%. But this is a more probabilistic view, which says that while it's most likely that it's impossible to produce heads, there's still probabilistic density over these other values. What's interesting uh, and good is that as soon as we see a single head, the red distribution, uh, distribution kind of curves down. Instead of curving up, it says that there's literally a 0% chance that this coin can't produce heads, which makes sense. We just saw a head. It would be impossible for the coin to not be able to produce heads. In fact, now the peak of the distribution seems to be around one-third probability of producing heads. Uh, as we get more and more observations, maybe we see that we have 25 heads and 25 tails, and this distribution begins to be, uh, look like a normal distribution of 0.5. It continues to act intuitively, where if we saw 1,000 heads and 1,000 tails, this distribution would have a smaller variance but still be centered around 0.5. It makes sense. So let's do this for Gossip Girl. Basically, we have heads and tails, which are whether or not a blast was in favor of your agenda or against your agenda. And if we look at the first season, we get beta distributions which look like this, with the maximum likelihood parameters shown in, um, in uh, the vertical lines. Something that's interesting is that Blair was so drastically negative when we just took a sum, but if we have this more probabilistic view, she comes in basically in the middle. She comes in this, as the sec second highest, I guess not the third highest most likely, except for Vanessa, who we haven't seen at all yet. Um, but. By the time we get to the end of the fourth season, what we see are that these distributions tighten as we get more evidence one way or another for each one of these characters. Ultimately, what we get at the end of season four is that all these characters are kind of close together, which makes sense because my understanding of what happened is that the producers of the show had no idea who Gossip Girl was going to be, and so at the end of the show just randomly chose a character that they thought would work but didn't actually work. So perhaps there was some... Perhaps there were some signals all along, because using this simple probabilistic method, we see that even though it's not by much, Dan is most likely to be Gossip Girl, and ultimately, Dan is revealed to be Gossip Girl. 
Okay, let's move on. So, <laughs> I will admit that that's probably my most interesting example of the day. So, uh, so let's get to naive Bayes. If you're familiar with classical machine learning, you may say, okay, if I have multiple if I have multiple probability distributions, like the red and the blue one, how can I make a classifier using this? How can I, um, how, how can I, in the same way that I have logistic regressions, which will predict future points, how can I use these probability distributions to do the same thing? And the answer is basically through something called Bayes rule. And without going into the details, what this really gives you is the posterior probability, the probability of each model given the data, is equal to the probability of the data given the model times the prior distribution. To break this down even more, the prior distribution is basically, if I haven't seen any data yet, which model do I think it most likely is? If I, have no, if I have no belief over this or I don't know anything, this can just be a uniform prior. But if I have a process which generates positive examples at a rate 10 times more likely than negative examples, we can encode that it's 10 times more likely that you see a positive example than a negative example using this prior. The likelihood function is the simple thing that we were talking about before where you just calculate the probability or log probability of the data given the model. So this is the uh, just simple log probability calculations. The posterior is the probability of the model given the data, which is the real thing that you're after when you're trying to, when you're trying to make a prediction. So naive Bayes supports a predict method, which um, what you can see here is that if we take points on a grid, the, um, the dots, then at a certain point they stop being blue and they, stop, and they start being red. What this corresponds to is basically the arg max of the model over the posterior probability. Basically, it's the model that's most like, uh, that is most probable given the data. Uh, if, if you don't fully understand this, it's fine at this point. It's, we're not going to go too deep into it. But in addition to having this predict method that uh, like scikit-learn has, we can go a little bit deeper and look at this more probabilistically. Instead of having a hard call, that says this is component zero or this is component one, what we can say is what is the posterior probability that it's component one? In this case, component one is the red distribution and what we see is the posterior probability plotted. For points that are clearly under the red distribution or clearly under the blue distribution, we can see that the difference between the predict method and the predict proper method is trivial. It's basically the same thing. But what's interesting is that as we approach the boundary where the blue density and the red density seem to be the same, that we get more likely, that, that we're, less sure about our, um, we're less sure about our prediction. This can be incredibly useful because it allows you to identify boundary cases. And perhaps if you're in industry and you're working on a simple classifier, then what you're saying is that if the posterior probability is above you know, 0.99, we're sure of it. But if the posterior probability is between 0.4 and 0.6 or something, we really have no idea and we need to look at these examples more carefully. I oftentimes say that uh, this type of probability calculation uh, basically allows you to carry your uncertainty around with you, much like a graduate student. So there are two main ways that you can create naive Bayes. The first is that you can explicitly create distributions in the same way you were doing them before, and then pass in a list. If you want to have priors, you can pass in a list of that as well, but that's not important right now. The second is that if you want to use a scikit-learn-like method where you uh, create a naive Bayes that is unfit and then you fit it to data later on, you can simply pass in a constructor for the distribution that you care about. In this case, we're taking naive Bayes and we're passing in normal distribution. This means that when we fit this model to data later on, we will uh, we'll basically partition the data set into each label and fit normal distributions to this without you having to pass in initial estimates for any of them. Naive Bayes can be a lot faster than scikit-learn. Here we're just looking at a simple uh, normal distribution on one dimensional data. It would be a bit unfair to compare pomegranate's multivariate Gaussian dis, uh, naive Bayes to scikit-learn's multidimensional one because uh, scikit-learn does not learn the full covariance matrix of your, of your multivariate Gaussian distributions. It only learns the diagonal. Pomegranate learns the full covariance matrix and in many practical applications, learning the full covariance matrix is not only useful, it's necessary. However, what we can see here is that in this example, um, we are increasing the number of samples per component. There are two components, so basically the total number of samples is this times two. And we can see uh, I ran a comparison between the two five times, and I'm plotting the mean as the line and the min and the max as the, um, as the colored area. On the y-axis, we have the number of times faster than pomegranate is. 
when I first ran this plot, I thought I was being a little bit cocky because if the numbers come in under one, that means that scikit-learn is actually faster. But fortunately for me, it seemed as though it was the right thing to do. What we see here is basically that if we have a small number of samples, that pomegranate can start off being around 11 times faster than scikit-learn at making predictions. As we increase the number of samples, uh, this seems to converge to being around twice as fast as scikit-learn at making predictions. Likewise, with fitting, this, uh, fitting the naive bays, um, we start off being around four times faster, and we seem to converge to being around twice as fast as scikit-learn. On the bottom, we have accuracy plots. Basically, we're making predictions about the data that we just, uh, I think it's the data that we just fit on, and just to see whether or not we're getting the same results between pomegranate and scikit-learn. We're getting a basically purple plot here, which is showing that we're getting exactly the same results between pomegranate and scikit-learn. So the increase in speed isn't because I'm making an approximation or not learning the full thing. It's just because naive Bayes is faster. I also talked about the out of core API that uh, pomegranate supports. Scikit-learn also supports an out of core API um, for some of its methods using the parcel fit method. So I wanted to compare not just the speed in doing this, but what exactly was going on. Because when you every time you call parcel fit using, using scikit-learn, you get a fully fit estimator. Whereas in pomegranate, you have to call from summaries in order to update from summaries. So it's not exactly the same. However, it seems as though uh, pomegranate starts off around four times faster and ends up being around twice as fast, so that's diminishing. And it's producing basically the same classifier as um, uh, scikit-learn is. So let's get to a less interesting example than Gossip Girl. Basically, let's imagine that you have some process which is generating noisy signals. There are two underlying regimes. And when you're in one of the regimes, you produce data that's distributed normally uh, with some standard deviation and some duration. We can see here that I have some examples colored either blue or red to represent the two regime, the, the true labels of the underlying regime. We can take one of these segments, though, and we can reduce it down to the mean the standard deviation, and the duration. These would be three important characteristics to add to your model. We can say that means are usually normally distributed, and so we'd like to use a normal distribution in order to model them. We could say that standard deviations are usually gamma or log normally distributed, so let's use a log normal distribution to model that. And lastly, uh, durations are almost always exponentially distributed, so we'd like to fit an exponential distribution to that. If we were to use scikit-learn, we, we would only be able to learn multivariate Gaussian naive Bayes, whereas we know that these other distributions are more appropriate for the different dimensions. So what we do in pomegranate is fairly intuitive. We simply define the underlying distributions that, we, um, that we'd like to use, in this case the normal distribution, the log normal, and the exponential. We pass this into an independent components distribution, which basically says that I am dealing with a multivariate problem where each from the other. Basically, there's no covariance matrix to learn. Then we pass these independent component distributions into the naive Bayes in the same way that we were passing normal distributions to other distributions in beforehand. We can then fit the model in the same way that scikit-learn fits their models, except in this case, instead of fitting a Gaussian uh, naive Bayes, we're fitting a naive Bayes that has these appropriate distributions on each one of the different columns. This can be very practically useful. We see that the naive Bayes using normal, log normal, and exponential distributions gives you around an 84.6% accuracy. However, if you use Gau uh, multivariate Gaussian naive Bayes, you only get 81.8% accuracy. So it seems like simply by choosing the appropriate distributions to model your data, you're getting a 3% accuracy gain without needing to go in and collect more features or collect more data or anything else. In this case, I'm comparing the multivariate Gaussian naive Bayes implemented in Pomegranate to the one implemented in Scikit-Learn to give to give baselines. Basically, it's expected that the two, that pomegranate and scikit-learn are giving you the same results because they're this, basically the same model. So I talked about stacking distributions. Let's get to the first example of that. We were talking about Gaussian naive Bayes or independent naive Bayes or whatever. Let's talk about Bayesian network naive Bayes. Bayesian networks are just distributions which are factored along a graphical structure like this one. So there's no reason why we couldn't put them into a naive Bayes structure. This is a typical uh, example of a um, this is a typical example of a um, uh, Bayesian network that talks about uh, a person's performance in school. Basically, we see that 
uh, whether or not you get a letter of recommendation depends on the grade you get in a class. The grade that you get in a class depends both on your intelligence and the difficulty of the class. And the grade that you get on the SAT depends on your intelligence. However, let's say that we want to detect cheating with this. For a normal person, this may make sense, that people who are more intelligent and take easy classes are more likely to get good grades. But if you're cheating in the course, then there is no real connection between intelligence, difficulty, and grade. So let's compare it to this Bayesian network. Uh, in this case, what's happening is that uh, we got rid of these two edges. We said that whether or not you get a letter of recommendation is still dependent on the grade because hopefully the teacher, may, I guess not hopefully, but in this case, the teacher doesn't know if you're cheating or not. The grade that you get on the SAT does depend on your intelligence because we're saying you're not cheating on the SAT, you're just cheating in this class. And so we're getting rid of these two dependencies. The way that we are distinguished between these two is still using Bayes' rule. The posterior probability, which model is more likely given this data, is still equal to the likelihood times the prior. If we know that 99% of students aren't cheating, then we'll be able to put a prior distribution on our naive Bayes saying it's most likely the person isn't cheating. But Bayesian networks can still give you likelihoods of data under them, so there's no reason we couldn't plug that into the likelihood function here. Uh, so the exact code for creating this is basically you create a Bayesian network, then you create another Bayesian network, and then you feed them into the naive Bayes here. The two Bayesian networks are DN and DC. If you want the exact code for how to do this, you can see this either in the, uh, you can see this in the tutorial later on, basically. Um, but we can, we can use exactly the same methods that we would use beforehand with this. If we want to predict the probability, um, if we want to predict the probability of some data, we see some intuitive results. Uh, basically, the numbers here correspond to just like reading, where it's, you start at the top and you go right, and then you go down and you go right. So the first column is intelligence, and then difficulty, SAT, grade, and then letter. The bottom two show the most extreme examples of being most likely under these various distributions. And it makes sense that if you're an intelligent person taking an easy class, uh, and you did well on the SAT, but you did not get a good grade in the class, then it's very likely you weren't cheating. Like, why would a smart person cheat and still get um, th this is meant to be a rhetorical question, not like a real question that you should answer. The most extreme opposite example is someone who is not intelligent taking a difficult class who did not do well on the SAT but still managed to get a good grade in the class uh, and then ultimately did not get a letter of recommendation. Letter of recommendation doesn't actually matter in this case. This is basically a simple example of a network. I've implemented here a binary network, but pomegranate supports uh, multinomial networks. Basically, you can have an arbitrary number of distributions. Excuse me, you can have an arbitrary number of possible, um, of possible values in each one of the nodes. What I do not currently support are linear Gaussian networks. I'm planning on supporting those soon. Those are high priority, but currently I only support discrete networks. You can imagine a more complicated version of this would bin people's intelligence into, say, standard deviations from the norm on an IQ test, and difficulty of the class would be far more complicated. Grade would be, instead of just good grade and bad grade, it would be a whole variety of different things. And in fact, we can make this example more complicated, that instead of just looking at a single class, maybe we care about every class that this person has taken, how difficult every class they took was, the grade they got in every class, and the letter that they got. And so instead of this being one edge here, it would be one edge per class that they took. You could encode a person's whole academic history in a Bayesian network and calculate the probability that they were cheating versus simply got lucky or unlucky in a class. I don't really want to talk about Markov chains. Uh, they're very simply implemented, and if you, if you want to use them and you understand what's going on, you basically just feed in an initial distribution and then conditional di distributions of increasing size. Um, they're in the tutorial, but they're not very interesting, so I'm going to skip them for now but they exist. Let's talk about mixture models, which I think are far more interesting. Let's say that you have data which looks like this. It seems as though there are two normal distributions, but you don't have labels for this. How are you going to fit a distribution to this when clearly a single uh, normal distribution isn't going to fit and you don't have any labels? This is where mixture models really come to your aid. You can say that I want to create a mixture model of normal distributions, but specifically two normal distributions. Uh, when you fit to the data, it uses an algorithm called the expectation maximization algorithm in order to fit these parameters. Scikit-learn also implements this. But the way that expectation maximization works is basically you have this chicken and egg problem. If you knew which 
uh, which normal distribution generated each sample, then you would just feed all the samples of that distribution in and do maximum likelihood estimates. You know, calculate the mean standard deviation of those points. If you knew the parameters of the distribution, you could calculate which, uh, with the probability of the point falling under it. But you don't know either of these things. And so the way the expectation maximization algorithm works in a nutshell is that you basically iterate between these two steps, figuring out the probability of a point falling under that distribution, and then updating the parameters of that distribution given that assignment until you reach convergence. What you end up he with here is this bimodal Gaussian distribution that seems, to that seems to very well model the underlying mixture that's going on. In the same way that Naive Bayes was able to calculate the posterior probability of the components, mixture models can do exactly the same thing. In fact, Gau uh, mixture models and Naive Bayes are basically the exact same thing except for how they fit data. Naive Bayes fits data in a supervised manner and mixture models fits data in an unsupervised manner. But other than that, they are literally the exact same algorithms to calculate the, the um, to do predict and predict prava. In this case, let's calculate the posterior probability of the two components, the two normal distributions that we just fit. We can see something that makes sense, that basically they clearly fall in, under one distribution or the other until we get to around the boundary, when it becomes a little bit fuzzier and then they become more likely to have been in the other distribution. But there's no reason that we have to stop at uh, normal distributions. Let's take here a mixture of exponential distributions that I created. Instead of passing in normal distribution, you can just pass in exponential distribution. It's a distribution that I support. You just pass that constructor in. You say that you want to have two components of exponential distributions, and you fit it. it. Seems like you get a really good fit if you fit these two exponential distributions to that data. And it required no additional work on your part to add things or hack things together. Lastly, something that you could do is instead of passing in a constructor, you can explicitly pass in the distributions that you want to mix. In this case, let's mix an exponential distribution with a uniform distribution, because maybe what you're saying is that this, this spike at the beginning was caused by an exponential distribution, but then after this decay, it's equally likely that you're generated from any of these points. We can see after fitting this distribution that that's a terrible idea, but this is simply saying what pomegranate supports, not what you should do. Uh, so you can basically pass in, uh, you can pass in a list of any arbitrary distribution that you'd like and mix them together. So, uh, Gaussian mixture models can be faster than scikit-learn. Sometimes they can be surprisingly so. I want to say as a caveat that while it looks like, uh, th th there are two main caveats here. Uh, both of these algorithms will want, run for one iteration of expectation maximization, but they were initialized differently. I didn't go through and have them initialized the same way, and so that explains why we're getting different accuracy results. In addition, um, when running speed tests before, I have never seen this number before. Uh, this number being quite as fast. I've seen it be 20 times as fast, 30 times as fast, but not nearly 100 times as fast. So I, I'm, right now I'm willing to chalk that up to being some sort of, I don't know, my laptop was doing something different when it was supposed to be doing scikit learns. But the consistent message here is that Gaussian mixture, uh, general mixture models are way faster in pomegranate than they are in scikit learn. That as you increase to nearly 8,000 samples per component or 16,000 total examples, you're still almost 20 times faster in pomegranate than you are in scikit-learn. Prediction is all, uh, stays steady at being at around uh, 15, 10 to 15 times faster. Meanwhile, we seem to be getting similar results. Not the exact same results because these algorithms are highly dependent on how you initialize them and we aren't initializing them in the same way. But it seems like we're getting basically the same results in pomegranate as in scikit-learn. If we instead look at multivariate Gaussian distributions instead of normal distributions, we say uh, we can see something similar. Basically that pomegranate can be way faster at fitting these multivariate Gaussian distributions. In this case, it seems like it's around five times faster as you increase the number of dimensions of the data. Um, pomegranate does seem to have more variability in the underlying model. Uh, and this is, um, this is something else which I would like to look into, but my understanding is that basically what happens is that scikit-learn uses something called the Cholesky decomposition, which is an approximation of the underlying al uh, algorithm, whereas uh, pomegranate learns the exact full covariance matrix. And sometimes in mixture models, given the weights that you have, this can cause very weird things to happen. So it's something which I'm going to look at in the future, but it seems like it's producing something, um, it's, it seems like it's producing something similar. So let's go back to the noisy signal example that we were talking about before. Uh, basically, what we're seeing is that 
what, what we had before is that we had two underlying components that were generating these uh, that were generating these signals. Previously, we required we required that we had labels on each one of these segments in order to train our naive Bayes classifier. A more common example is that we don't have labels, and so we want to be able to do a some sort of mixture in order to figure out the two underlying components of this uh, of this signal. We can do it in pretty much literally the exact same way that we did naive Bayes. We specify these distributions in exactly the same way, and instead of passing them into naive Bayes, we just pass them into general mixture model, because that's the model we're passing it into. We can see that using Gaussian mixture models with the appropriate distributions is giving you 76% accuracy versus the 72% accuracy that you would get um, using multivariate Gaussian distributions to model the entire thing. Again, you're getting an increase of 4% accuracy just by using the appropriate distributions in order to model this stuff. Like I said at the beginning, these are mixtures of distributions. And a hidden Markov model is just a structured distribution over sequences. There's no reason why we couldn't have mixtures of hidden Markov models. So what we do is we basically have a sub-function here which creates a, a hidden Markov model. We create two of these hidden Markov models and we just pass them into the general mixture model. The graphical model of these, um, it's basically the same underlying graphical model with the same edge probabilities, but different emissions for each one of them. Basically one of them has a normal distribution centered around 1 and 7, and one has a normal distribution centered around 3 and 10. We can do normal things that we do with a mixture model here without having to think about it. Let's say we generate five samples from the first hidden Markov model and 10 samples from the second hidden Markov model. If we try to calculate the posterior probability using predict proba, what we see are things that are intuitive. The first five points are more likely to have come from the first distribution. The second 10 point, but the the remaining points are most likely to have come from the second distribution, except for this one, which is kind of an oddball. If you want to fit your distribution, you do it in exactly the same, uh, yeah, if you want to fit your mixer, you do it in exactly the same way. Let's say we generate 100 sequences from the first sample and 100, from the first hidden Markov model and 100 sequences from the second one, just for, uh, just for expediency. What we see is not only that we get updated transition probabilities for the different models, but also that the prior probability is appropriately learned. We learned uh, one third of the incoming data came from one distribution and two thirds came from the other one. And what we're seeing here is that uh, we're learning that it's a prior probability of one third chance for the first model and prior probability of two thirds for the second model. All of this is without you having to think at all about what expectation maximization is going on. Especially since both hidden Markov models and mixture models both use EM, you don't have to think about how you're going to stack EM algorithms within each other. Now let's get to hidden Markov models. This is, how the, this is how the package started, and so it's basically the flagship implementation of Pomegranate, the thing I'm most excited about. Uh, the most feature, the, the best uh, competitive package which I found is a package called HMMLearn. So I created this, uh, this chart which shows things which Pomegranate supports versus things that HMMLearn supports. I'm not going to go through each one of these. This can be a reference for you to look at later if you care about it. But the most important things that I personally shouldn't have done that. The things which I personally care about the most are silent states, a sparse implementation of the underlying structure, having arbitrary distributions on any of the states, tidy missions, and most importantly, multi-threaded training, which we're going to get to at the end. Let's take a simple example from bioinformatics, which is the field that I'm in. Uh, this is th this this idea called a CPG island. Basically, if you have regions of your sequence which are enriched for CG dinucleotides, these are oftentimes correlated with the function of the sequence. Uh, you can find things like genes, promoters, and so on near CPG-rich CPG areas. So one of the first tasks that hidden Markov models were used for were to try to identify where these CG, uh, CPG islands were in the entire genome, for example. It would be kind of silly to go through and say, all C's and G's belong to CG islands and all A's and T's don't. That would give you pretty much no information. If you took a rolling mean, you wouldn't be able to figure out what the exact edges of these CG islands are. Whereas when you use a hidden Markov model, you're able to get exact boundaries on these things through a, a global basically a global dynamic programming algorithm. The way that you create this in Pomegranate is easy. You first start off by defining your two distributions. Let's say here that we have a background distribution where everything is equally likely and then we have a distribution where C's and G's are more likely, but A's and T's are still possible. Because in CD islands, we still see A's and T's just at a lower frequency. Then we have this state object, 
which is present because this is a graphical model. We pass the distributions in, we give them names. Then we add the states in, and, we ha and then one at a time, we add the transitions uh, between all of these nodes to each other. This modularity allows you to build structures, um, allows you to build structures from the ground up. You can build them within a function slowly instead of needing to define a big, dense transition matrix uh, at some time, which possibly couldn't even fit in memory. So let's say that we had a sequence here. I've, ins I've carefully inserted a single CG island into the middle of it. And we can see here that the CG island detector basically identifies the middle part, where ones here correspond to background sequence and zeros correspond to CG islands. We can see that the, uh, basically right at the boundary here between the G and the T and the C and the T, that's what we call our transitions. We're getting the most optimal CG islands here. One of the things that I don't personally like about this is that it's calling the end a CG island as well. We can utilize the underlying structure of hidden Markov models in order to say, you can't end on a CG island. You have to end on background sequence. The way we would do this is add a, sim a single edge to the exit distribution. Um, in this case, it's just one more line where we add a transition from the state to the end. And here we, um, uh, this is what it looks like. One of the other features which I like about pomegranate is that uh, is that if the edges leaving a node don't sum to one, it will automatically normalize these edges so that they do sum to one. Sometimes this may be annoying, but it can allow you to do more, more interesting things like, um, it can allow you to do more interesting things like uh, basically say that sometimes you want, you want this set of transitions and sometimes you want, the, uh, you want, to, add a, you want to add a single other, uh, sometimes you want three edges leaving a node and sometimes you want four edges leaving the node. And all you have to do is add that single edge in the if statement, as opposed to redefining your entire structure, and it will automatically balance it for you. So what you can see here is that by adding this edge, we basically say, hey, there can't be a CG island at the end. And so when it makes predictions, it doesn't say there's a CG island at the end, even though there's some evidence, because you literally can't get to the end um, from the CG island state. If you want to look at this in a more probabilistic uh, in a more probabilistic way, then we can get the posterior probability that each element in the sequence falls under each state. Uh, we can see here, basically, I'm plotting the posterior probabilities for each of them, and the CG island seems to have a high posterior probability uh, for the CG island state in the middle, but it seems like it's a bit iffy on the, maybe not a bit iffy, but there's, uh, it's not a determinist, it is not a hard classification of one or zero, it's the actual probability, and this can be fairly useful. Hidden Markov models are way faster than HMMLearn. Uh, there are four main algorithms which I compared. The training time using the bomb welsh training algorithm, the maximum a posterior algorithm, which is predict faba, the Viterbi algorithm, which will calculate the single best path through the model, and the uh, log probability of, the log probability using the forward algorithm. Basically, the most important thing here for most people is the training time. And we can see the training time is this purple line that goes way up, um, it's not the one that spikes here, but it stays up here. So it seems like with large models, we're getting to be around 20 times faster at training than uh, HMMLearn is. All, basically, all of these algorithms are faster, but training is particularly important. One of the reasons that this is the case is because Pomegranate has an underlying sparse implementation. HMMLearn, to my knowledge, uses the full graph transition matrix and just multiplies that by itself a whole bunch of times. If you have a sparse graph, most of these elements are going to be zero, and you're wasting a bunch of time. Pomegranate only stores the edges that actually exist. And so when you calculate these functions, you can get massive speed up, basically changing it to be a number of states times number of edges in the complexity versus number of states squared. Let's add a little bit more structure to this. Let's say that we know that there are exactly three CPG islands in our sequence. We can base, this is going to be impossible for most of you to see. This. But basically what's happening is that we're saying we can start off in the background of the CG island, and then after the CG island, we go to a background state eventually. Then we go to another CG island eventually, then a background state, then a CG island, then a background, and so forth. And so we're saying there are three CG islands somewhere in this sequence, but I don't know exactly where. If we take a look at the predictions, then what we're seeing is that the original model will identify a single CG island in it. Whereas if we look for state predictions 0, 1, and 2, we see 0 here, one here and two here. This can give you, a, this can allow you to basically regularize your predictions, saying that 
I know that the structure of the underlying data is like this, so I'm going to explicitly put it in my hidden Markov model. A problem that arises fairly quickly if you try to do this type of thing, though, is that if you try to fit your model to, to some data, you'll see that the background distributions and the CD island distributions will diverge from each other. Here, we're looking at two different CD islands, and after training, they have wildly different distributions. After training, the background uh, distributions have wildly different distributions, and we don't want that because we're basically modeling the same phenomena, but uh, we just want that phenomena to happen multiple times in a very structured manner. The way that we can deal with this is something called tying distributions together. The idea is that when you tie a distribution together, you say that the, when you're fitting, the, uh, when you're fitting uh, se your sequences to the data, to the, me, when you're fitting the model to the data, if the data fits one of the distributions, it fits all of the distributions that it ties to with the same probability. The way that you can do this as pomegranate is trivial. Instead of passing in different discrete distribution objects into each one of the states, you just pass the same, literally the same discrete distribution object into multiple states, and now they're tied with each other. To get a practical feeling for what that actually means, if we try to train our model with these tied states, what we see is that after training, these now have exactly the same distributions. This makes sense because these are the same underlying phenomena, and so we want the same distribution for each one of these states. Another thing that pomegranate supports is this idea of silent states. Uh, the idea is that you want to have states which uh, your sequence can pass through without emitting anything. Basically, let's say that you have this very dense structure where in each layer of the hidden Markov model, you can connect to everything in the previous thing. I'm not going to bother coming up with an example for this because that's not important. But the idea is that you have a huge number of edges here. And since all of the algorithms in pomegranate take time proportional to the number of edges, it would be beneficial in order to reduce the number of edges in this model. What you can do is add silent states between each of the layers. If what you were saying before is that it's possible to go from any of the states in one of the layers to any of the states in the previous layer, all you do is you add a state in the middle and say, OK, now all of them can go to this silent state in the middle, and the silent state can go to all of the others. You can dramatically reduce the number of edges in your model while maintaining the same expressivity. This reduces it basically down to n squared from n squared edges to 2n edges, which could be a massive savings. The way that you implement these silent states is that instead of passing in an explicit distribution, all you do is you pass in none. That makes sense. If there's no distribution, you don't pass in anything. So uh, now let's talk about Gaussian mixture, uh, mixture model HMMs. We talked previously about mixtures of hidden Markov models. But now let's say that we want our distributions on each one of the states to instead of being a single distribution, we want it to be a mixture of distributions. We do it in the exact same way that you would imagine you would. Instead of defining your distribution to be a normal distribution, you define it to be a general mixture model of distributions. And then you pass that into the state, and everything works exactly the same, exactly as you would imagine it. All you do is you pass in the mixture model as the distribution instead of a simpler distribution. Let's get to Bayesian networks. I'm starting to run out of time, so I want to make sure I get to the finale and have time for your questions. Bayesian networks are basically a powerful inference tool, which define these dependency structure between variables. They're especially powerful because once you define the structure of a Bayesian network, you don't need to have information about each one of the variables in order to do inference over an arbitrary set of the other variables. Let's take an example from medical diagnosis. Unfortunately, not all of us can be Dr. House, so let's call this Bayesian network HUT, or Dr. HUT, because it's not quite as good. Uh, this Bayesian network has three main layers. The first layer are genetic conditions. In this case, I'm considering BRCA2, BRCA1, and LCT, which is involved in lactose intolerance. In the middle, I have three conditions that you may want to be able to diagnose. In this case, ovarian cancer, lactose intolerance, and pregnancy. In the bottom, you have symptoms that a patient would feel, something like low energy, bloating, loss of appetite, vomiting, or abdominal cramps. The edges here represent dependencies that for example, you're more likely to have low energy if you have ovarian cancer than if you don't. That makes sense. When you are using this network, what you would like to do is take in symptoms from the patient that you do know about and genetic information that you do have and be able to do inference over this middle layer without needing to have all of these. You don't want to, be able, you don't want to restrain yourself by saying that in order for this model to be useful, you have to run the test for BRCA2 and BRCA1, even if it's doesn't even seem like it's going to be cancer at all. The way this works is slightly different than the other models. 
that you can pass in either a list that corresponds to the uh, that corresponds to each one of these states, or you can pass in a dictionary where the keys are the name of the state and the value is the value that that state takes. If you don't pass in anything, what you get is the marginal probability of each one of these nodes given no evidence. Uh, most of these make sense that if you come in and you know nothing, then maybe 10% of people who come in with unknown conditions, uh, with unknown conditions, are actually pregnant, and you're most likely symptom is bloating compared to the others. Now you can, let's say that we have a patient who says that they are suffering from bloating, low energy, but they are not suffering from loss of appetite, vomiting, or abdominal cramps. If you feed this in, then what you see, um, if, what you see is that if you care about these three values the most, you would say, okay, well, the probability of having ovarian cancer has shot up. In order to be safe, I'm going to pursue that further and order tests for BRCA2 and BRCA1. When those tests come back, let's say that you test negative for a mutation in BRCA1, but you test positive for a mutation in BRCA2. This causes the probability of you having ovarian cancer to skyrocket. You went from basically 16% to 92%. And the probability of these others is very low because the symptoms that you have can be explained by the fact that you would have ovarian cancer rather than needing some complex mesh of all of them. Let's say that another patient comes in, and the first thing they complain about is that they're suffering from vomiting, bloating, and low energy. I know that this is an exciting topic for all of you talking about vomiting of patients. Uh, what we see most likely is that there's a 91% chance of ovarian cancer and just a 20% chance of pregnancy. Um, this, so this is actually a real-world example that I read about, uh, which is particularly interesting to me. Um, in order to fill in all of the symptoms, the doctor said, okay, well, it seems like you have ovarian cancer, so I'm going to just assume that you have a loss of appetite uh, and you don't have abdominal cramps. So he put that into the network. The network basically said, yeah, so there's basically a 100% chance that this person has ovarian cancer. Uh, what happened is that then a nurse came in and wanted to check all of these symptoms and went through and all the, the patient agreed with all of them, except for loss of appetite. The person said that they were suffering from cravings as well, which is very unusual for someone with ovarian cancer. And so if you plug that in, what happens is that not having a loss of appetite still means that it's likely you have ovarian cancer, but this probability of you being pregnant also jumps. This person ended up both having ovarian cancer and being pregnant, which was terrible but they were able to live long enough to deliver the child because of this diagnosis, because of the nurse actually asking the proper questions. So a Bayesian network is extremely powerful if you're able to use it correctly. Let's talk about built-in parallelization. Pomegranate has this, you're covered. You don't need to think about this. You don't need to implement your own things. Uh, I basically right now have simple wrappers for these parallelization things, but it's only going to get better and more intuitive to use the more time I have in order to implement these. Let's say that we implement a mixture of multivariate Gaussian distributions as you would expect with some you know, vector of means and some covariance matrix and you have some data. If you want to predict, then you can either call the predict method and that will work as normal, or you can use this predict functional wrapper where you pass in the classifier the data, and the number of jobs you want to use. It makes sense that the number of jobs equals one and predict basically give you the same thing because underlying, that's what exactly happens. But if you increase the number of jobs, then you get faster prediction. The more data you feed in, the more efficient this parallel processing is. It, has a lot of, it can have a lot of overhead at the beginning, but if you have gigantic data sets, then you're going to get basically a linear improvement uh, but by using multi-threading. Here I was doing a small example because I wanted to make sure it finished in time for me to give this talk today. Uh, th this is in contrast to other libraries which many, many of them may implement parallel processing for model fitting, but almost none of them implement parallel processing for uh, the predict prediction or predicting the probabilities uh, using these models. Now let's compare just to make sure that I'm not cheating somehow. We compare all of the predictions made by using the predict method to all the predictions made using n jobs equals 4. And we see that we basically get a complete match, that there are, uh, there are, 25, possible, there, there are 25 possible classes, and in each example it gets the same result as you would expect, and it orders them properly for you without you having to think about what the ordering after parallelization would be. 
If you want to use naive Bayes, you can pass the same distributions that you made your mixture model with into the naive Bayes classifier. Let's say you want to predict probability, uh, predict the probability in parallel. You see a you see a pretty big speed improvement if you use number of jobs equals four compared to just uh, going at it by itself. And there is literally no difference in the uh, probability calculations that it returns, which is which is kind of, which is really good given that it's returning doubles, not integers. So uh, with my remaining 15 minutes, I think, I'd like to talk about, um, I'd like to basically get into the finale. And the finale is going to mirror the research that I was doing as an undergraduate. And it's going to tie in many of the concepts which I've introduced to you about pomegranate so far. Basically, my research was about identifying ep epigenetic modifications of cytosine. These are small modifications to the underlying DNA sequence which can turn, on, which can turn genes on or off. This makes sense because every, ce every cell in your body contains the full copy of the human genome, but you have a wide variety of different cells. How do you have different cells if they all have the same instruction set? One of the reasons is through uh, DNA methylation, where you turn off genes that aren't related to the functional task you want this cell to produce. Unfortunately, right now, when you try to sequence DNA, it's a pretty complex method in order to get this epigenetic landscape. You have to first sequence the DNA, then you have to do some like crazy chemical uh, modifications on it, uh, they ca you have to bathe it in some sort of crazy chemicals and then sequence it again and compare the two sequences and then you can infer it. And there's actually no published error rate for how good this is, so you kind of have to trust that it's just working. We were hoping that the nanopore, in addition to distinguishing the four canonical nucleotides from each other, could also distinguish these different epigenetic states of cytosine from each other. So what we did is that we created template molecules, which were identical in every position except for one. And this, in this one position, it bore either a cytosine, a methylcytosine, or a hydroxymethylcytosine. Uh, basically, this would end up influencing eight positions, flanking, uh, eight positions, including these three positions that are indicated in red. What you would see are the eight states would look like this for the different modifications. That for cytosine, you'd have some pattern. For methylcytosine, it looks like you had some states which were around the same and some states which had, uh, some states which were uh, had a higher amplitude. With, compared to hydroxymethylcytosine, it seems like you might have a higher beginning, but a lower core here uh, when it was passing through the nanopore. So what we did is we created a modification of something called a global sequence alignment hidden Markov model. What this does is basically a repeating structure of these three states. A silent state representing a delete, basically they don't quite line up. A uniform distribution representing an insert, again, representing they don't quite line up but in a different way, and then a match, saying that at this position, I want to see an A. So if you wanted to model exactly the sequence CAT, you'd put, in the new, you'd put in C here, A here, and T here. Each column corresponds to one position in the profile that you would like to model. We knew what was going on in the underlying uh, sequence here because we had the underlying sequence. So we were able to create a model which um, so what we'd like to do is create uh, three separate models. One model for cytosine, one for methylcytosine, and one for hydroxymethylcytosine. Ultimately, this is going to be a mixture of models, just like we had a mixture of different samples in the experimental apparatus. However, what we'd also like to do is tie together some of these states, not just within the same model, but across different models. In this case, the insert distribution, we wanted it to be something which um, was basically like a uniform distribution or something non-informative, but we didn't want different insert probabilities at different positions in the profile because we didn't have data to support that, and we didn't want different insert probabilities in different models because that doesn't make sense either. They're all modeling the same phenomena. But also, we knew that our sequences had some beginning which was identical for all of the sequences and some ending that was identical for all of those sequences as well. It was only in the middle that they were different. And so what we wanted is to tie the beginning distributions for uh, this model across all three of the models, and we want to tie the end distributions as well, only allowing the middle distributions to vary. In pomegranate, you can probably see how this type of thing is intuitive. You create the distribution objects that correspond to all these positions you'd like to see, and you just pass literally the same distribution object into different models. This means that they're tied not just within the model, but across these different models, because they're literally the same object. We then create the three models, model C, methyl C, and hydroxymethylcytosine, and we pass them into a general mixture model as we've done in the past. 
If we create a random sequence from the first one, the second one, and the third one, and do predict probability, we get results that we would expect, that the sequence generated from the first hidden Markov model is most likely to have come from it, the middle one from the middle, and the last one from the last. Now, this is basically the grand finale of the things that you can do in pomegranate. So I'm going to compare the time that it takes to fit this model to around 1,000 sequences that were generated from it. Unfortunately, I don't have the actual data anymore. I forgot to give myself access to that when I left the University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, so uh, I had to basically make synthetic data for expediency for this talk. So we have 1,000 samples that are randomly generated from the components of this distribution, and we'd like to fit it. But we don't want to just fit it because uh, in my real case, with models which are slightly big, not slightly bigger, but much bigger, and much more data, it would take, uh, it would take several hours in order to fit. We want to compare fitting normally to fitting using one of these parallelization wrappers. And what we see is that we get a major speed improvement. Basically, the first two take, uh, all three of them give you the same total improvement, which is the total improvement over the course of the Baumwell's expectation maximization algorithm. It means they're giving you the exact same results. But we're seeing that it takes about 92 to 96 seconds to do it with one thread, but 29 seconds to do it with four threads. It basically means that we're getting a three times speed improvement using three threads on this, um, on this kind of hacky thing that, not hacky thing, this, um, this simple parallelization wrapper, um, this simple parallelization wrapper that I wrote. Uh, I don't have a slide to show it, but I have run hidden Markov models with 48 threads on my research computer and you get pretty much a near, uh, you get pretty much a near linear improvement in the speed based on that. And to my knowledge, not only is there no package which supports hidden Markov models to the same extent that Pomegranate does, but none of them support any type of parallelization. So, let's go back to the main point that I want you to leave here with. Pomegranate can do more than other packages that do similar things. It can do it faster than these other packages, and it's very intuitive to use. Also multi-threading. Thank you for your time.